something useful. Here he is, Mark Weiser. And, um, well, his, his ubiquitous computing vision um, can be a little bit digressed in, in, in three ways. He, is, he first of all says um, computers uh, should be spatial. They should not, we shouldn't dive into computers. The computers should be everywhere, and they should sense where we are. So there has to be a lot of sensors, and they have to understand us. They have to understand our body language, and that will enhance our interaction with computers because when um, we have this, this, now right now we aren't using our hands and our eyes, and if we use the rest of our body, we have way more bandwidth, as it were, to connect with all these computers. Um, secondly, he says things should be invisible. They should be uh, um, away. They should go away from us. They should leave us do our daily things, and they should uh, be invisible butlers to us. And the third thing that's really important to know about uh, ubiquitous computing, and that's the most important thing, is really that it, it is a vision. Um, it is not so much a logical extrapolation or a, a theory that says this is how uh, a programming language can be made better. You know, if we implement this, it will become better. This is very much way beyond this. This is a, a vision for the next 20, 10, 20 years. And as such, um, in my thesis and in, in this talk, we'll see that this has a lot of implications. Um, visions have their own little niggles, as it were. The big thing that Mark Weiser was afraid of was information overload. I mean, it's pretty self-evident for him. If you get more computers, if you get more sensors, there's going to be a lot more information. If there's going to be a lot more information, how the hell are people going to deal with this? This is going to be so much, we'll, we'll have a big problem. That was one of his big main reasons for creating this idea that, um, of the invisibility part of his idea. These computers should take away um, they should do the processing for us. If there's so much information, they should take a slice of that. They should become intelligence. They should think for us, in a way. So he wants to automate daily life through invisible technology. Um, and there's the intelligence part. And you really see um, how he envisioned that we're going from traditional computing, which was desktop computing at the time. Uh, you can go in two directions. You can say, I'm going to make mobile computing, which would be the mobile phone. And that's still, that's changed the level of mobility, but not the level of, of sensing of our environment. And the other thing is pervasive computers, where you get environments like cave, and which are, just a room like this would be full of sensors, and they would know where we all are. But combine the two, and you get ubiquitous computing. You get this pervasive, everywhere, um, computers that are highly mobile, highly attached to our, 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 our persons, and integrated into things. Um, but I believe there's a big discrepancy between this, this dream that he had and, and reality. Um, and as, I was, as we were researching this and as we were trying to create this curriculum, we kind of came to a few things that we found were dubious and that other um, we found were more and more researchers and theorists had also seen. The first problem really with Weiser's idea of the future and the idea that computers can be invisible and everywhere and understand us is that they assume that the world is easy to analyze. Um, if you can analyze the world, you can create systems that automate parts of it. But it turned out, uh, as Lucy Sugman explains, that it's really not that easy. Um, Lucy Sugman was a, a co-researcher uh, at Xerox Park, where Mark Weiser was working. And they were working on a smart uh, copying machine. And this copying machine would um, take what the, the design team was trying to do. They were trying to analyze people's goals when they went to copy something. So you'd have the machine, they'd be like, well, people would often want to co make four copies of something. So we should automate that and, and try to uh, understand in a menu what people want to do. But what Lucy Zuckman found when she went to with this team and, and did the research, that this hardly ever worked because, you know, John would be copying his four copies, but then... Then uh, Carol from accounting would come, oh, I really have to do something quickly, and can you please go? And he was like, yeah, sure, you know. And then the situation of it changed, and that kind of threw all the automated plans of these people in the water. So this is what she calls situated actions. She says people are highly situated, and these situations are highly changeable and highly complex, and uh, very difficult to predict. Yeah. 
This for me is a, a good example of, of, of that idea. It always makes me smile. I mean, we, we hardly ever, you know, this is something that I can see a, a group of nerds or a group of designers thinking about. You think, oh yeah, we'll make this there and then it'll be fine. But you don't, don't see this. There's so many things that you don't see as a designer, which is perfectly normal when you were only human, but one of the points in this lecture I'm trying to make is that, that we often forget this. So what Lucy Sugman basically said is, is social reality is, and what we found is social reality is so complex and very difficult to predict. And this makes uh, the idea of computers being everywhere and uh, helping us really quite difficult because they have such a hard time understanding us. Uh, I always take the example of you're sitting on a, in a lounge chair and you're reading a good book and you look up and think, oh yeah, that's brilliant. And then this intelligent lamp thinks, oh, he's looking at me, that means I have to turn on, and he turns on, and you're like, oh, and you're completely out of your idiom. You know, it's, it's, it's this kind of uh, difficulty that you could um, imagine. I mean, the world really is very messy and, and out of focus. That's always what I find very funny when I was working a lot, uh, because I also have a very technical background. Often you would work with people in a team, and you'd, oh, we're going to make this application, and... Um, or you work with people who are working at, at a, a data center, and be like, oh, we're going to make this great system, it's going to be high speed, it's going to be awesome, it's going to be great, it's going to replace our current system. And, um, and they say, oh, yeah, you talk on a bit, and they say, so how is your current system? Oh, man, it's horrible, it's full of bugs, and uh, it's, it's put pieced together by duct tape. And I always found it odd that they never made the connect that, you know, once their current system was also a grandiose project, but had to turn to duct tapiness. And of course, their current project will probably also end up being moderated, being, getting in situations that are you couldn't predict where you'll need duct tape. Oddly enough, funnily enough, Weiser recognizes this very much. He says, um, the solution is in the future. He says uh, something that a lot of uh, people who predict the future say, what futurists often do. They say, well, it's, it is a problem, but we'll get there uh, in the next five, ten years, people will really figure this out. And that's how it always goes. And within five, ten years, we'll have the solution. And you often find that futurists use this kind of, of talk. They often say, in five, ten years, we'll have uh, uh, the, the solution. And what will start is a, a new era. Futurists often talk about new eras and new times, new ages, and a revolution. Um, and that's how we get to the next problem, which is the expectation horizon. Graham McCracken says that uh, the future is where society safeguards her ideals. So these ideas that we have about the future are highly idealized versions of, of, of what we want. Like when I watched Star Trek, it really was you know, an idealized version of the world that would never, ever really come to pass. Um, we find, uh, according to philosopher Rein de Ville, that... Um, Every society does this. They create images of the future which are at once unattainable, yet claim to be inevitable. Uh, Mark Weiser would say it's inevitable this is going to be happen, but at the same time we find that if you really look at, at the pragmatic level, the practical level, it'll never happen. Um, and this is because of this, this highly idealized uh, notion is where society saves that. And you often find that the futurists have two notions of, of telling us about this. They'll say, um, Either they'll call it an alluring future, which says, oh, it's going to be great if you do what I say, or they're going to describe it as a storming future that's storming at us, and it'll be a dystopia unless you do what I say. 